Jim, and I welcome Professor James Guthrie. Uh, for the Hansard record, could you please state your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Okay, my name's James Guthrie, and I appear as a professor from Macquarie University. Thank you. Um, the committee received your submission number 39. Uh, I now invite you to make a short opening statement and at the conclusion of your remarks, I will invite members of the committee to ask you questions. Good, thank you very much, Senator. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear in front of the committee today in regulation of auditing in Australia. I will just take a minute to give a, a brief background on myself so you have an understanding of my expertise. I started work for a chartered accounting firm in the late 60s and early 90s, I say 70s, as an audit clerk. So we're going back quite a while. I then uh, did a Bachelor of Accounting and Auditing from RMIT and I was one of the first graduates in Australia in a specific degree program with Accounting and Auditing. I then taught uh, auditing at Deakin University, Warrnambool campus, it was called something else in those days, of course. Uh, and I then went to UNSW where I taught auditing and undertook a PhD. My PhD was in public sector accounting and auditing. And I specialised in two parts. One was public auditing, which I enjoyed. And the other one was the history of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts Committee. I was one of those people who went and read all these reports back from the First World War and had a bit of fun doing that, as one can do in a PhD uh, when you have time. Uh, I went on from that, Macquarie Uni, uh, and then Sydney Uni, and I retired about 10 years ago. And I was lucky enough to take up a few positions where I continued to teach auditing and the public sector accounting. And then uh, I'm a 0.5 research uh, <coughs> professor at Macquarie now, <coughs> so like a 40-year history, roughly wh where I come from. So uh, in the next few minutes, I suppose I should just briefly give you an overview because my report is quite detailed and it comes off the back of work of colleagues of mine in the UK and that is very detailed. There was 15 academics involved in that. They were commissioned to uh, do a review of uh, the audit in the UK and documents clearly uh, what's happening in the UK in regard to the audit market and uh, issues with case law and the role of the trade, what they call the trade associations, the professional bodies and that. Uh, I believe in the audit space we've got a real issue. Uh, it's just not an Australian issue, it's a global issue. Uh, I argue in my um, submission that this is a grand challenge for nation states, that we need to get a handle on what has happened in the audit with the big four, because they've grown so, so big and powerful, they're an oligopoly in themselves. There's significant conflicts, there's inherent risks in the business model as it goes forward, <clears throat> and this could have significant impacts for the financial markets and for the economy as a whole. Um, in terms of uh, specific observations, I've just got three short observations. The first is that external audit clearly is really important. The credibility that comes with the audit of the financial numbers helps us understand a little bit about the organisation in terms of its financial performance. Uh, the auditor does not provide any assurance as to other information <coughs> in the annual report. And that's been an ongoing debate in terms of commentary, uh, management commentary and other information that's provided in the annual report. There's no audit of that. It's specifically on the financial information. And the nature of the audit and opinion has changed over time, in my time, significantly over those 40 years, from what I would call a true and fair view uh, to now just an opinion on if the accounts are being presented in terms of international accounting standards, which narrows it down significantly. Secondly, quality concerns. Uh, I'm in the financial review again today. I'm a bit worried about the journalist because he keeps calling me the aged 
accounting academic, <laughs> veteran, I think he might have called me today. I need, I need to say, look, just back off on that slide. Uh, clearly, ASIC have identified that they're concerned with quality issues. Um, my position on quality is we can have a debate a lot about quality of auditing in Australia at the present time. My position is it's market failure. When there's a failure, that then we can explore the issue of quality of audit, if there's a failure of a large corporate. Now, um, the only problem with that is when there's a failure of a large corporate, most times it doesn't go to court. It's dealt with outside the openness of a court system, an independent system to review the work. Uh, thirdly, um, I think that I have issues with my colleagues behind me, uh, the three colleagues representing uh, the Accounting Association and the Financial Reporting Council. I read their submissions, chartered accountants. Uh, they said there's no problem <coughs> with audit quality. It hasn't been brought to their attention. So I'm just having a bit of an issue there because I'm thinking myself, global financial crisis, $100 billion at least in the global financial crisis has been spent. Uh, values disappeared out of companies. National Companies were nationalised. Banks, in, I was a professor at Bologna. I studied the Italian banking system. They've been propped up to the tune and still continue to be propped up in Europe, the banking system. Billions, $100 billion at least was used in that situation. And I'm not quite sure Professor where Jeffrey, audit sat I'm, in that. I'm, I'm, in, I'm very loath to interrupt you because yeah. I'm enjoying um, hearing this, but I'm very conscious of the limited yeah. time the committee okay. has. Um, I, I might start with a couple of questions yeah, yeah, that, that flow on directly from that. Um, to be fair to your colleagues behind you, I don't think they would have said that there's no problems with uh, auditing anywhere in the world. I think they're conflicting, uh, restricting themselves to just Australia. So on that question, Perfect. what's the best evidence of a problem of the quality of audit in Australia? What's the data set that you would point to that say, right, that shows we've got a problem of quality of audit in Australia? Uh, well, I suppose the reports that are coming out in terms of the percentage of uh, uh, the audits that were reviewed by the independent body, and it's very small, and the sample is over 18 months, but they're showing, on average, I think for the top uh, four, 21% were problems. So I went and I went looked at the PwC one that's been released and had a bit of a study of that mm -hmm. and went to two factors in that. So I went to, I think it was Case B, which was an insurance company, and that's the one I'm quoted on today. Um, <clears throat> I went in detail. The problem with those reports is it's generalised and you don't know what the organisation is. Mm -hmm. So then I went and I looked at QBE. I thought, oh, this might be QBE. I have to have, you know, a large insurance company. So I had a bit of a look at the annual report. And what do I find in the annual report? Uh, there's a statement by the directors to the effect that audit and non-audit services should not be over 50%. What did I find? Two thirds of the fees paid to the company, the auditor, were for non-audit services. And I start to question in my mind, if there's that much money, we're talking about hundreds of millions of US dollars being paid for non-audit services, what are they providing? Are they just providing strategy, uh, PR, communication, or are they actually providing operational services? So are they providing advice about systems and processes, which all would have a calculative practice in it and an accounting number, which then would be converted into a financial number, which would appear in their profit and loss or their balance sheet? And that's the issue I have, is that we, we're not quite sure what these services are and if there's a significant conflict in that. Sure. And, yeah. 
So, so just on, on that figure you cited, um, which I believe is the ASIC figure from their audit inspection yeah. program, um, we had ASIC as our first witness, and this is one of the issues I raised with them, and I asked them, you know, could, could we rely on that figure to extrapolate across the industry as a whole? Was it a representative one? And they said no for two reasons. They said, first of all, the sample's not big enough and yep. they'd have to do a much bigger sample in order for it to be representative. But secondly, they have a risk-based approach. They go and identify the highest risk areas and so you would expect um, potentially to find uh, greater issues in those areas. Um, in order for them to do a random sample across the whole industry would require, you know, prohibitive resources for them yeah. to do. So are you aware of any other data sets that can substantiate this issue? Is no. there anything else we can point to? No. And, and that's why I make an argument in my submission. It's when audit failure, that's the only time we can get evidence yeah. in a court case yeah. as to about what the problems were. Okay. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for your submission and uh, the depth of uh, research that's embedded in it and drawing from the international context. Um, but before we get into the detail, can I just ask two overarching questions? What is the problem that continues to be denied by witnesses you've been hear hearing from this morning? And uh, the question of proof that, the quest that, that has just been raised again, is ASIC's current articulation of the problem enough of an imperative for Australia to start to get change in this area? Do we, do we, do we need to act now? Well, I suppose in the helicopter, we've got to say that um, conflict of interest is an important issue because that wasn't there 40 years ago when I first started as an audit clerk. And we had the green pen, you know, we're going back a long time. That has grown, and it's grown to a point now where the big four are an oligopoly. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but we can't, you know, I go to the question of audit failure, and I go to the question of Enron and Arthur Anderson, which disappeared in a month. So what happens if there's a big audit failure in one of these partnerships? They just go insolvent. They just move on, put the advisory out here, we're back to three. So I sort of go, go to the position that the, the conflict of interest is really important. The argument about the need for knowledge on the audit is a non-argument because we had the Auditor General here. We got lots of audit that are independent statutory auditors that undertake audit and they don't need to offer a whole lot of other services. So that's a false argument, in fact. Well, I think that's a false argument. Mm. And we've got the Auditor General, we've got audit, state auditors around the world, we've got tax auditors, we've got a whole range of people that don't provide advice, which could turn around, and we heard the Auditor General today say that, well, they don't do that because we might have to come in and audit later on. And the Auditor General, of course, is a little bit different because they do performance audits mm. on behalf of the Parliament, which takes them into a whole lot of different areas mm. rather than just financial statement audits. Mm. Um, but your evidence this morning has gone to that diminution of the true and fair view, I think you articulated, mm. as to a narrow, uh, narrower standards like a... In establishing a standard, often there is a contraction of professional and ethical duties, mm. and you've articulated that. So I guess it comes back to the clarity of the Auditor General's comments. If I have to audit you, I am not going to be in a relationship with you. That's that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and I think but there are very intimate relations going yeah. on between the big four and the the companies across Australia that they're supposed to be auditing independently. Yeah, and, and well, you know, the big four is an $8 billion industry in Australia, so it's quite significant and they have a lot of influence and power and their people travel, which is good. Um, so conflict of interest is the first one. The second one was... You know, I was trying to think what the second one was. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, if I, if I go to um, 
your submission where you say the big four auditors have incentives to overlook risks in a financial statement order because it may limit their ability to sell usually higher margin non-audit work to oh, audit well, clients that's... and two the big four accounting partnerships may be reluctant to do auditing work for clients if consulting work which usually has a higher margin is on offer this limits an already limited choice for company auditors and may impact audit quality you said that and can i also say that off the record um, we have heard from advocates for no change that um, audit will be just such an unpalatable job to have full time that if you didn't give these young people graduating from you know universities the opportunity to move into consulting services we just wouldn't be able to get enough auditors. Uh, well, so I ask you to respond to those three themes. Yeah, well, that's okay. The culture, I go to the culture of the firms, um, and I would have taught thousands of auditors in my time uh, that went on and started off as audit clerks. Um, well, the cultures of the firms seem to be a low cost model now. They, they, they seem to be, um, the evidence from the UK and the UK report, which I found really interesting, was uh, a court case and it was a big financial collapse. And the partner of the audit firm actually only billed five days work on a huge half a billion dollar audit. I was like, huh? So the model is one where they bring the graduates in, the graduates do the, the work. And remember the graduates, I did a thought leadership piece for the chartered accountants and a lot of this work has been done offshore now. So it's not even been done here, it's been done in India. And then you run into issues about audit quality, uh, systems and processes, because the partnerships here subcontract to the partnerships in India to do audit work of Australian companies. So it all becomes a little bit messy in, in, in trying Indeed. to understand what that culture is and, and, and the nature of the audit work. Um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, just to that point, having audit work being done uh, offshore. The people who are doing the audit work offshore um, are considered part of the auditing firm here in Australia or are they separate companies uh, they, that they're well, setting up? Well, the one I, I, well and, I won't name one. My final question. Yeah, yeah, no, I, the, there was one I looked at Sorry. Uh, when I was doing my thought leadership piece, and they have 20,000 people work in India and other parts of the partnership all around the world send their work to India to be done. Okay, so a lot of the a, processing work. It's an organisation that's been set up. Deloitte's, well, it could be Deloitte's, India. Mm. It could be KPMG, India. They all have offshoring yeah. going on. Who would, I suppose the Australian side of that particular organisation would be responsible for any flaws in that auditing? Somebody here well, the Australian sign. side is uh, signed off by the audit partner who is registered. So your, audit, your auditors in Australia are registered. It's one of the few yep. industries that are actually registered. Accountants aren't registered, mm -hmm. but auditors have to be registered and licensed. So if there's any um, uh, flaws in that auditing work which are consistent over a period of time, they're picked up down the track, would our regulations and legislation cover well, those people offshore? Well, in other words, to... I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. We'd, we'd have to get legal advice, but... Uh, if there's any flaws, assume that uh, it should be picked up by the, the Australian body as to the quality of their audit. But I don't know how they deal with that. That's, you know, that's like the culture thing where, where they employ the young graduates and send them out as fodder on, you know, 50 hours, six, well, I'm so, just so the, reading the some point, of the submissions, the 50, point 60. The you're making about, you know, the, the quality of, the capacity of graduates who are out on site, you know, often without anybody overseeing what they're doing, according to what I'm hearing and mm. what people are telling me off the record, yet when we ask a, ask a partner about that, they construct a completely different reality of the way that the business model operates and, you know, all of the structures and regulatory, you know, barriers that they've got in place. Yet that doesn't match with what people are telling us who are on the ground and what you've just said. Well, so who's telling the truth? Yeah, well, I, well, I, 
you know, I think you need to ask the partners about how much time they spend on a particular audit. So you just pick the Westpac audit and find out how many hours, billable hours, the senior partner actually spends on the audit. Because uh, that, to me, will give an indication as to how much energy and knowledge they put into a major audit. So I expect that we will do that indeed. Can I go to um, page two of your submission where you mention of the uh, Chartered Accountants of Australia and New Zealand 2019 paper on audit quality in a multidisciplinary firm, what the evidence shows. Can you run us through the main points of the report and what your takeaways of the report with regards to the validity of the evidence that they used? Um, and, and does CANS serve the desires of the big four accounting firms? Oh, that's a bit... I worked for them for nine years as their academic advisor. Um, Are you declaring that as a conflict of interest? Or well, any, no, no, it's not anymore because I, I, uh, I resigned from chartered accountants because yes. I thought they were taking, not in the public interest, but were looking after, they were acting as a trade association looking after their members' interests rather than acting in a public interest in, in the way they were going. Uh, There's a conflict. Okay, so I, I remember I used, I can't remember, I, I was careful with the words I used, but did I refer to their report as fluffy or something? Mm. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you definitely um, questioned the validity yeah, of the yeah, sort of evidence that they were putting cause, forward. Because what I did, which, when I read the submission, I was thinking, well, this is a big four submission. And then it went to a point where it said, well, the academic evidence supports this notion that the big four should have audit and advisory because it leads to experts. And I thought, OK, I'm an academic. So I looked up the paper. It's a working paper. And I reached out to the, the person in the Netherlands that wrote it. And he's come back and said, well, I can't get it published. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, it's not even a peer-reviewed piece of work, oh but, they're, but they're saying it's central that academics support this argument. And I'm saying, well, that's not the way it works in academia. Uh, and then this notion that... So, so they're relying on the work of an academic that cannot achieve peer acceptance for publication? Well, he might have now. This is like last month or whatever it is, but he wrote a nice little email back and I, I said, I can't, well, I can't publish it in my journal. I run a big journal. Because uh, it wasn't of sufficient quality for you to Well, we don't it. know. Yep. But, but I did have a quick look at it and I thought, well, it's really not arguing that. But I think... So and to I, understand I, what you I just said... I think the author of the report for Chartered Accountants has done it, like I do all the time, Mr Google, and it's come up with this paper and he's read the title and gone, OK, this means all academics support this idea. Professor Guthrie, perhaps not yeah. let's spe speculate how people did their own work. Yeah, they yeah, can sorry. attest to yeah, that yeah. themselves. Um, Senator O'Neill, uh, well, just we, a couple we, more If minutes. we could have a longer inquiry, we could get him here to answer the questions. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. Um, no, that's, that's good. Thank you very much. Could I just um, summarise your evidence there that you have concerns about the quality of the submission uh, and the validity of the arguments put forward by CANS, you believe that they are serving their members as a trade organisation and not serving the public by pushing for higher standards of audit. Is that a fair um, summary? Well, embedded in their constitution is they must act in the public interest. The professional accounting bodies must act in the public interest. I think at the present time they're looking after their members' interests as a trade union, okay, that's all right, but they're not actually getting to the issue of audit quality you actually and the continuance said, of audit quality. You actually said uh, the Cairns paper does not provide research evidence but is a polemic piece supporting, oh, did the, I? Oh, it was a bit naughty supporting the big four <laughs> accounting partnerships. It's in, it's in your submission. Can I oh, go sorry. to... It was a good day. Um, you, yeah, highlight, a good day. you highlight a finding in your submission on page four that the sale of non-auditing services to audit <laughs> clients compromises independence as auditors form judgments and report on the very transactions that the firm themselves created. That has been borne out uh, by the ASIC inquiry into... Um, PwC, which is now a public document, even though um, 
it's been tabled in this form today in the Senate. Yeah, no, I. Um, I Could think you expand was, on that? Um, well, <coughs> I looked at uh, case number E. Yes. Uh, in case number E, for, for they admit that yeah, that they admit that two thirds of their fees come from non-audit services, and actual staff went in and worked in the organisation. So that gets to my point. If they are providing mergers and acquisition advice, if they're providing advice on products, loan products, if they're providing advice on. Uh, uh, international monetary transfers, if they're providing advice on remuneration, all these things get into calculative practices and systems and processes of the organisation, so it's which the auditor should review and form a judgment on that. Is it a form of enmeshment that's happening now? Well, they're getting, I mean, they're getting bigger and bigger. They want to grow 20% every year. I mean. It's What's like, the risk if they achieve that success for their business to the Australian economy and the uh, well, people who the audit is supposed to serve, shareholders, investors, consumers, yeah, suppliers, well, the government? My, my yeah. argument is they're too big to fail now. If one of them fails, you've got less competition. That's why I argue for a statutory, that's why I argue for a statutory auditor of the, the, um, yep. the uh, financial services industry and I see there's a bill going to be in the Senate next week, which I was lucky enough to have a look at that. And that's making the similar argument that uh, Australian banks be audited by the Auditor General that used to happen in the old days. So that's the idea of a statutory auditor for that financial services industry, because it's, t you know, it's a real concern now that my pension which I don't get a lot of, but at least I get a pension. My pension is all tied up in shares now. Yes, it is. And if, if and we the start decisions to have real issues... Senator O'Neill, yeah. th I'll have to hand the call to Senator yeah. Wilson and then Ms yeah. Hammond. Just, just on that, you, you recommend a statutory order. Mm. Uh, in, in in your, so uh, whose bill was that, as a matter of interest? Pardon? Who's bill did, who's, who introduced a bill to the Senate? Senator Wilson, that's a late uh, question. It's going to be I next... Do you know the answer? <laughs> it's going to be next... I'm told it's going to be next... Monday, isn't it? it? It may be. I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. yet. Is that yeah. a government bill, Chair? <laughs> I don't know. I must, I must say, I'd be very surprised if it was. But <laughs> okay, well, let's um, maybe it's a private member's bill. I'll see if I can follow that up. But the I did, I did, to I did to want to ask the auditing of Australian banks. But, but do you agree? Do you, you, could you just quickly elaborate on why you agree a statutory auditor for the banks is a good idea? Well, they're just so important to the Australian economy, the financial mm. services, and the Royal Commission. Now I've gone through and had a bit of a look at that. And there's a lot of evidence that what I would call <clears throat> internal controls, operations, just the general running hmm. of the banks has led to illegal activities, fraud, um, misconduct, distortion, all that sort of stuff. So hmm. it would just seem to me that we would think <coughs> that the banks shouldn't be just well, I'm just picking on the banks, focused on financial markets and share mm. price, they should actually be fo focused on running a business. Okay. That, I'd yeah. love to elaborate more, but unfortunately we've got limited time and I've got yeah. a couple of other just quick questions. Um, could, you, could you put me out of my misery? Who, who audits the auditors? Like who, uh, we know who audits their quality and that's ASIC, but who actually audits their accounts? Well, their partnerships. I don't know. You don't know either. Okay. No, they're, 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 they're one of the few organisations that aren't transparent. So you can't find transparency documents about these partnerships. Their Does accounts. It, considering they've been uh, in the UK. It's the same for any partnership. Yeah, it's a yeah, partnership. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, but. No. Manage, look, it's order 95% of the economy. Well, and, and they're multi billion dollars. Less than private. Yeah, we, we can have a debate right, about that. We can debate about that. Let's just have some Does it surprise you that's the case given, for example, in the UK they were, and the term that I heard was that they're labelled as the gatekeepers of capitalism, that, that we don't know anything about them and, and what they pay themselves and. Well, they, you know, they've got a couple of things going on. They, they do announce what they pay themselves, but what they pay themselves is completely different to what their worth is, because the partnership must have a capital component to it. These billion dollar organisations must have a capital component, which you buy into. Mm. Uh, 
None of that's listed. If it was to be listed on the stock exchange, they most probably can turn them into billion dollar advisory firms. Okay. Would, that, would that have a market capitalisation of billions of dollars. So, so they're not audited then, basically? That well, any reasonable... I don't know what happens to them. I suppose the only audit becomes the tax. And they're, the they're, when, when we get to tax, they're very good at tax. And, and you, you've mentioned um, Jeremy Hershorn's evidence, which I asked those questions in, in, est in various estimates to get, to get that kind of response. Um, all right, well, I'll follow that up later because I don't have much time. Um, you, you also say that the kind of you make it very clear in your submission that the litmus test for whether we should be considering reform, and thank you by the way for a number of proactive recommendations yes. that are easy for the committee to follow, would depend on the number of corporate collapses and failures, which is similar to what Professor Fell said. Oh, did he? Uh, Good. And you've talked about some overseas examples, but I wanted to put an Australian example to you that that actually is quite personal to me yeah. and and my state and um, arguably in the committees that I've been involved in since I've been a senator in seven years was the biggest corporate collapse I've seen in Australia, and that's the managed investment schemes of the timber companies, you know, $4, $4 billion down the drain. Um, has anyone ever done a case study of the audit quality around, for example, uh, Great, Great Southern, Ernst & Young, Guns Limited, KPMG, um, ABL, uh, Timber Corp? Has anyone done any... I know there's been court cases between the liquidators and the auditors mm. and... Well, is what, that something you looked at what as you find in, What you find in the academic <clears throat> research is very few people actually do research looking at actually what happened in audits and what happened in financial collapses. Most mm. of the research would be about judgment, about standards, a range of things, but mm. very few academics would uh, explore and highlight that. Now, my only example myself, I did with Michael Gill a piece on Tricontinental and the Royal Commission in Tricontinental and auditing, yeah. and that was really interesting, but that was not counted as in academic research because it got published <coughs> in a book, but that was, I had to do a lot of reading about uh, Royal Commissions, about audit, Tricontinental, state banking, and what happened in that collapse. And that was clearly an audit failure, um, yeah. but very, very little research in, well, in the Australian context. I'm, I'm careful about how I say this, but the Senate Economics Committee kind of came up with essentially the view that those MIS schemes were Ponzi schemes in the end, and that they'd been, you know, been trading in some of them has clearly been trading in solvent for a long period mm. of time. You know, I, I might, I might um, come, come, come back to that later. Um, you used the word licence in your submission a number of times that um, audit firms have a licence to operate. Are you referring to social licence there or a formal certification? No, no, I process? talk about the social licence because right, I, okay. I, I quote from the Financial Times, the partner of the Big Four, saying that they're in the UK their social licence has now been damaged and they need to split up and they've actually announced that audit and advisory will be split in two different organisations. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how independent that's going to be, but that's already in place in the UK. Uh, so the big four there are taking this quite seriously, the discussion yeah. about uh, conflicts of interest and independence uh, and making the moves to split them up. And they've been allocating staff already to different... You're saying reallocating staff within their... Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay. If they can do that in the UK, <coughs> why is there such vociferous opposition to it here in Australia? These are the same companies. Well, they're not the same that... company. They're different partnerships. Yep. Right. That's an so important point. So, so the business owners. model might be they, they make more money out of non-advisory, so therefore their pay is more every year. They, they might decide. And then it becomes the risk, because my understanding is they... And I could be completely wrong here, you'd have to ask them, but they do a lot of self-insurance, so around the audit space, the partnerships okay. would self-insure. Um, so that would become an issue, because audit clearly, if there's audit failure, auditors are uh, in the firing line. So, We're so right on time. Just, just last question, Chair, just, just very, it, just, it was just a final question for my line of questioning. Um, Jeremy Hershorn, in his evidence <clears throat> given to the Senate, he said, for example, in your, I'll read your submission, second, the second commission indicated that in particular 
the research and development incentive scheme, aggressive transfer pricing, hiding behind legal privilege, not providing correct information to an ATO audit are high risk strategies that draw attention to the big four's social licence uh, to operate. Um, are, are you, are you, do you believe that they, they have done damage to their social licence? Uh, I and think that... I was quoted as a veteran <coughs> academic in the financial review in that I thought that was very insightful and that I think that whole aggressive tax thing. Um, Do you think the people of Australia care enough about this or know enough about their, their, their critical role in, in the public interest? We, heard, we saw the Westpac CEO this week in a leaked document say, he said to his own executives, this is not going to really resonate with mums and dads in mainstream Australia, don't worry about it. Mm. Go out there and sell more mortgages. I mean, do you, do you really think this is already a significant matter? Of I just read the financial review coming up in the plane today and that Westpac thing is getting worse, not getting better. I it's suspect just, it's the tip of the iceberg with yeah, other banks just, as well. I'm, but, I'm amazed but, by but, it. But, but in, in relation to this, this, this issue within the, the big four, because we've, we see a lot of parallels between the banking sector and potentially the audit consulting yeah. sector, do you, do you think Australians really understand what they do or care well, or, and, and therefore the scrutiny won't well, follow? Well, you know, like, mm. how can I put this? If the big four are providing to government policy advice, operational advice, uh, reviewing the financial reports of government, all of a sudden you're starting to say, where's the independence in it? Because at least we have a, a so-called democratic system, a parliamentary system, where there's accountability. Mm. Now, in, in the paper this morning, it talks about front page GY getting paid a heap of money to review this two years ago, this problem, and doing a PowerPoint presentation. But which problem are you referring to? The Westpac? Oh, the Westpac oh, problem. Oh, right, okay, yep. Trillion yep. dollar bungle. Yeah. Trillion dollar. Well, the committee, will be the committee will be calling them to ask some questions Yeah, directly. so it, it, it's just like, well, mm. okay, that's not in the open. So their advice, we're not quite sure. It's especially when they deal with government. Mm. Um, so I just have some issues around it. I, I mean, I looked at the website of the big four, as <coughs> like, you know, semi-retired, so I've got nothing else to do. You sort of read this stuff. And they call themselves, oh, what's the word? Brand companies or something, brand organisations now. They're there to sell a brand. And I'm thinking, no, that's not what you're there for. You're supposed to be professional service providers. Mm. Ms. Evans. And, and thank you very much for your um, submission and for coming in today, Professor. You made a comment earlier on about um, sort of uh, auditing from years gone by to auditing today and that they've gone from producing a true and fair view, I think it was, yeah. and I, I might be misquoting because yeah, no, I true. scribbled it down, to simply yeah, compliance with accounting <laughs> standards. Would it be your view that the role of auditors their responsibilities and the complexities that they have to deal with has, has changed dramatically over a period of time and that perhaps the regulatory environment hasn't kept up with that? Is that...? Well, they're dealing with organisations now. The, the QBE one, I looked at the numbers. These organisations are huge. The number of transactions, millions or tens of millions of transactions a day. So the complexity is there for sure the financial complexity. And the accounting, remember the accounting now, a lot of the accounting is not based on what I would call, and I'm happy to call it the cash system. It's based on estimates and ideas about what could be. <laughs> so it's about the future and making estimates and putting numbers on it. Um, so it's so much more co complex now from the, the good old 60s. Uh, so should we also be, then be, and just a genuine question, perhaps um, changing what we expect of auditors as well? Well, in the Australian situation, I, I would think, I would like, and I, this is my opinion, yep. I would like to see the auditors actually form a view on the internal controls and processes 
issues around fraud, issues around uh, auditors form judgments on other information that's in the annual report, because the annual report is really important because that's the historical document mm. of what the organisation has done for a period of time. So any um, uh, management commentary, especially about what's happening in the future and what's happening in the organisation, uh, I would like to see the order to form judgments on that. So then we could say we, we feel confident that the information that's coming from the organisation is reliable. Uh, and that's something that worries me a lot in that we seem to, well, the Westpac chairman, if there's a couple of pages in here today, I'm thinking, well, they're saying one thing to the public, but internally another thing's happening. And they're trying to work out how to deal with it. <laughs> okay, uh, well, final question from the deputy chair, and then uh, we'll have to move to our next witness. Um, first of all, that, uh, on page 10 of your submission, <coughs> you talk about um, uh, transparency reports, and you mentioned, and I'll just quote you, transparency reports published by the big four are economical uh, with uh, their information. One reason for that is that the firms have effectively been making their own rules. Would you clarify on uh, that well, a little bit and just yeah, you know, well, what sort of rules are they making and what is making their own rules? Okay, so I went to these tra so-called transparency reports to see what's in there and to read them and a lot of the material has been consolidated so you can't actually understand what the practices are. There's no standards for what should be in a transparency report. So on one hand, they say, look, we're very transparent. We will report the number of audits we've done. We'll report non-audit services. Mm -hmm. But how they do that, we're not quite sure. Uh, we're not quite sure how they consolidate those numbers, what numbers they're reporting, mm -hmm. how they're reporting it. Uh, and the transparency reports are more like a, well, I have to be careful. Are they a bit like this, Professor? Oh, no, 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 no. They're more more like a marketing document. Okay. I don't know if you read one. They, they, they should more be colourful. due out soon. They, they should be due out uh, any day, the, the, the next lot. And you read them and they're just like a marketing document. How good we are at audit. Um, and we've got all the systems <laughs> and processes in place. We follow all international auditing standards. Uh, we're very good at it. What's the corrective, and, What's and the corrective to this The problem? big four, the, the, they are the auditors of the largest corporations in the world. They are, you know, I, I put a number, I've looked up a number, like they're, they're bigger than, I think they sit about 40th and each of them sit about 30th in the world in terms of comparing to countries. Like, they're huge. The numbers are just like, blew me away when I started to look at how big they were. I'm afraid, Professor Guffey, yeah. that's all we have time for today, thank but you. I thank, thank you very you. much for coming and giving okay, your thank you, sir. Uh, evidence.